In this interview, I sit down with Tracy Lee to talk about shooting the night sky. This is Twitter. All right, Tracy Lee, welcome to This Week in Photo. How you doing? I'm doing great. Thanks for having me. No, it's good to have you on. We have a lot of stuff to talk about. We talked about a bunch of stuff in uh, in Puerto Rico, uh, yep. and you gave me sort of a toe in the water experience, uh, literally on, <laughs> on <laughs> right. shooting on shooting the Milky Way and and what's involved with that. And I gotta say, I was intimidated, but uh, you made it seem really easy. So thank you for that. That was that was really cool of you. No problem. It was a lot of fun. I'm glad I had someone to go with because. I was obsessed with having to shoot the Milky Way while in Puerto Rico. So, well, we got it. We got it. Well, let, let's talk about that. I want to talk about the the whole the whole this whole interview is about that kind of photography, which is astrophotography, right? And that's the Correct. the art of shooting the Milky Way, stars, star trails. You know, any no. any. The night sky. The night sky. The night sky. So let's talk about that. So you looking at your Instagram. I'm gonna bring your Instagram up right now. So looking at your Instagram. You are pretty prolific in this, and it looks like you might have a, uh, you know, you might have some kind of affair going on with the Milky Way. <laughs> <laughs> I'm obsessed with the Milky Way for sure. Yeah. So what's up? So tell me what got you started in this kind of photography. Um. Wow. I took off to uh, Moab to meet up with a fellow photographer back in uh, 2016, in March of 2016, and I hadn't really shot the Milky Way at that point in time. And really, most of my photography was action sports. I traveled around the world with the UFC for eight or nine years. Yeah. And um, I'd never, I'd shot, don't get me wrong, I'd shot landscape stuff. But it was always like I'm off on a hike or off on an adventure with friends. Mm -hmm. And then I would happen to shoot a shot real quick while we're running by. So I'd never specifically gone on a trip just to shoot photos. So I went to Moab and met up with my friend from Canada. And he hated me after that trip because I made him, he wanted to shoot sunrise sunset and I wanted to shoot Milky Way. So I was shooting all of it and keeping him up all night. And then we'd wake up early or we wouldn't even go to sleep and we'd shoot the sunrise. And then I mean, it was crazy. And it, that was where I fell in love with the Milky Way because I ended up shooting some, what at the time I thought were phenomenal shots of the Milky Way. And I didn't even get the core of the Milky Way at that point in time. Cause I didn't know. So I, I went home from that trip and I had a friend who um, had a software that he wanted me to test out because I do social media consulting. So he wanted me to test out a software to schedule Instagram posts. Mm -hmm. So I was like, well, I might as well start a new account. So I started an account called Milky Way Chasers mm -hmm. and that is how it was born. Milk um, Milky Way Chasers. Okay. Milky Way Chasers. So I, uh, you know, constantly featuring all these photographers Milky Way shots. Uh, I obviously got addicted to it myself. I was constantly motivated, motivated by some of the top photographers in the world in astrophotography. And now, and now you're in it, and you're, you know, looking at your work, it, it, it's stunning. And I want to, I want to talk about the the work itself and some of the mechanics that go along with grabbing a shot like this, which is not really grabbing, right? Because you, you from what I've learned, is you know, most of them are multiple shots. Um, but I want to, I want to talk about the what I didn't, uh, part of what I didn't expect was the amount of planning and knowledge that needs to go into one of these shots before you even start clicking the shutter. You know, I was thinking like a lot of it, like many people think that, oh, it's serendipity. She happened to be in this awesome location and she knows how to take photos of the Milky Way. So she snapped the shot. It's not that way. Right. So explain, explain some of the planning. Actually, it's not. Right. Yeah. Usually it's not. It can be, but usually it's not. Right. Well, explain. And you, you introduced me to photo pills and a couple of other pieces of software. Explain like when you when you find out you're going someplace new and you know that there's going to be Milky Way in the night sky and you want to capture it. Once that's in your head, what next? What do you do next? First, I'll pull up Google Maps and I'll check out the location and see um, usually Google Maps or Google Earth, like satellite view on Google Maps. And I'll zoom in. So if it's an arch or if it's a lake or if there's a mountain peak or whatever, I just need to make sure that whatever the feature is, is that it's going to be in the south, south, the southerly direction. It needs to be in the southern sky. Yeah. 
um, and depending on what time of year as well. So this time of year, we're looking south to southwest. So at the beginning of the evening, the Milky Way rises maybe south-southeast, moves to the south, and by the end of the evening, it's um, south-southwest. So as the season gets later, then eventually it will end up at the end of the evening in the west, but it won't be in the east at all. So early season in March or even February, it starts in the east. So you just kind of have to know. I know at this point, I know where it's going to be. I've just done it so much. But uh, I use it, utilize a tool called PhotoPills, and PhotoPills can help me plan all of those things out. But the very first thing I do is pull up Google Maps to see, okay, what direction is this item facing? What, and then the next thing I check is what what day of the month am I going? You know, I, I look at PhotoPills. They have a moon um, app or a moon section of their app where it tells you, what part of the moon or what um, phase of the moon that you're going to be in and on that date. So a lot of misconceptions is that you have to shoot the Milky Way around new, new moon. And for beginners, that's a good rule to stick by. But eventually, as you evolve, you can learn to shoot when there's almost a full moon out. Yeah, yeah, that's great. And you were like one of the things that I learned from you was the using ambient light as well right because when we hike when we hiked out to that location in puerto rico on the beach you you did all what you just said you were on google maps you found the location you're pinching and zooming and looking at where things would go then you're photo pillsing it to see where the milky way was and you're like it's going to be right there perfect let's go to that location but then when we got there a surprising thing was you were like yeah see those lights on from those houses like 15 miles away, those lights are going to illuminate the rocks in the foreground, right? So you took all that into account, which I was like, okay, uh, I'm a little intimidated, but <laughs> okay. Well, a lot of times, uh, you know, with our eyes, you know, as we step out of the vehicles or we have flashlights on, it takes a while for our eyes to actually, you know, get used to being in the dark. Yeah. So you might not notice that there's ambient light hitting a uh, hitting a location the very next night after I went out with you, I went to another location and I didn't light up the foreground at all. And the foreground looks like it was the brightest day. Wow. Yeah. See, and that, a lot of that is, is just plain old planning. Well, let's talk about gear because we won't talk about the, the gear incident that happened on the beach there, <laughs> but there is, there is some specific gear that is that you've used or that you use to get the shots that you know I, I pulled up in your Instagram there. Talk to me about that and the importance of it. Does sensor size matter? Because you know I shoot micro four thirds and I'm learning that you know micro four thirds in low light sensor situations may not be the right tool for this particular job. Tell me what your opinion on that stuff is. Okay, so I started shooting the Milky Way on a crop sensor camera on mm -hmm. a Canon 70D. Mm -hmm. And I heard all day long, oh, you can't shoot the Milky Way on that camera, so on and so forth. So don't believe people when they say you can't. If you know how to use your camera, you can make it work. So that being said, I now shoot on a full frame, and it definitely made a huge in increase in the quality of my photos. So not in what way is it? Was it because of the the low noise or the or high ISO ability or what or what was it? 6D has a better handling of high ISO than okay. a lot of the cameras out there. So going to a 60 from my crop sensor was a huge difference. It made a big jump in the quality of my photos, but not to say I didn't come up with killer photos on my 70D. I mean, a lot to the point where people were like, I can't believe you're shooting this on a crop sensor. Yeah. So, and that had to do with the way I shoot. Like uh, I introduced you to what's called stacking. And uh, that's not to be confused with uh, new Lightroom stacking, but um, stacking in a program called uh, Starry Landscape Stacker. Mm -hmm. And that's because noise is very random. And if you take 20 or 25 consecutive images, each image, the noise is going to be in a different location. So you stack those 25 images or 20 images or even 10 images, stack them together, and it's going to reduce the noise in the photo. Yeah. So... Uh, you can be on a crop sensor or a micro four thirds and still get a high quality image because of that technique. And I've heard, I was talking to a friend of mine, we were talking in, in sort of preparation for this interview, we were talking about the different techniques that people use to shoot the night sky and to shoot the Milky Way. And he showed me a shot that he'd done that was one shot. 
There was one exposure because I was like, no, the Tracy Lee method is you got to shoot a bunch and then remove the noise. And then, you know, then you end up with this gallery, you know, level image. And he was like, oh, no, I just, you know, I do a long 20 second exposure. Boom. And I'm done and out. What What's your opinion on that? Is it is it just, you know, depending on the situation or the photographer or what? So I feel that um, as you become more advanced at shooting Milky Way, there's different things that you want to do. So when shooting the Milky Way, depending on your focal length, you can shoot anywhere from, you know, however many seconds on the short end up to maybe 30 seconds on the long end. But add into that wanting a longer focal length, then you have to shorten the amount of seconds because then the stars start trailing. That's the problem is the stars start trailing. So if I try to shoot with a 24 or a 35, which I have a lot lately, then I have to go to 10,000 ISO and I start shooting at um, 10 seconds. Mm -hmm. So 10,000 ISO, you can imagine that's kind of a high ISO. That's noisy. Yeah. So I could do one single shot, but it's gonna be a noisy shot. So as I start adding things to my tool bag, you know, like of different types of um, astrophotography I wanna do or different, um, like I said, longer focal lengths and so on and so forth, I have to adapt to that. So now I'm shooting at 10,000 ISO. Now I could probably going to stack because it's going to make that a better, high, higher quality image. Image. If I want to shoot at a 16 or a 14 millimeter wide angle, sure, I could probably do one one single image, no problem. Yeah, yeah. It just depends. I think it, it depends on like you said, your knowledge of what you're doing, right? Because you could right. you could boil it down like I'm I'm the newbie right now, um, self admittedly and at this kind of photography. And when you're new, you boil it down to a formula. I'm like, well, Tracy said do this, 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 and this. I'm doing that, you know, because I know that will yield well, good results. Well, it's just going to increase the quality of your results. Yeah. At the end of the day, you're just adding icing to the cake. Yeah. We got the cake, but these extra steps that you take, which I mean, you can always shoot 20 and use one. Yeah. It doesn't hurt you. Well, let's, so you're let's adding, adding extras. Yeah, yeah. It's, you know, more more is better or it's better to have more. Like what was in Boy, in Boy Scouts? It was to better to to uh, have it and not need it than to need it and not yeah. have it. Right. right. <laughs> yeah. yeah. So let's talk about the, some of the some of the nuts and nuts and bolts here. We talked about the gear. Obviously, you're going to need a sturdy tripod, but but not you're not going to need like a giant, you know, Iron Man tripod for this, right? Especially if you're using a smaller camera. Tell me tell me about that and and the and the tripod that you use because you have a very specific one that you recommend. I personally um, I'm sponsored by Slick Tripods, and I personally use the 634 CF. It's a carbon fiber tripod. Super light, less than five pounds, I, uh, probably closer to four. Uh, and the thing is sturdy, unless I'm in 50 mile an hour gusts. Then I, I don't think anything's that sturdy at that point. Yeah. But um, having that steady tripod is very important. I think having an intervalometer is important if you're stacking, because you don't want to sit there and cause camera shake on every single um, photo. And I did that for a long time before I ever did get an intervalometer. So you could do it and, and be successful st still, but mm -hmm. you can also set the intervalometer to take 20 shots, not think about it, and just hang out and enjoy the sky. Yeah, yeah, like we, we were doing, I know my camera, I'm pretty sure my camera has an intervalometer. Was, we were shooting with a, with a Lumix on my side, we were seeing with a Lumix G6, uh, was this G6? G9. Nine. Yeah, the G9, and it. I'm pretty sure it has a built-in intervalometer in there, but I had never used it, and we were on a dark beach, <laughs> so so we ended up we ended up pressing the button, and they and the shot came out. You know, I put the shot in the blog post here. Uh, reluctantly, but oh, it looks great. It came out good. It came and out, I was, but I look at your shots and I'm like, come on, you know. Well, you sent it to me, and I was like, there's almost no noise in this image. It's great. So I didn't realize that you had taken the initiative to download Starry Landscape Stacker, learn how to use it, and actually come out with a successful photo so quickly because yeah. most people, the first time they use Starry Landscape Stacker, have issues with it. Yeah, it's, there is a little bit of a learning curve. So once you once you sent me that, I was just like, wow. And the first time I used Starry Landscape Stacker, 
I didn't realize that the, the photos had to be completely consecutive, no breaks in them. Like there can't be a 30 second break in between each one because that moves the stars too much. Yeah. So I think me being there to make sure those were consecutive helped your success with that. But the fact that you went and did it, I was like blown away. I was like, oh my God, he did it on his own. But hey, it was the formula right. you set forward. I was going to like, okay, she said, do it like A, B, and C. Let me do it like A, B, and C and see if that works. And yeah, you're right. The Starry Landscape uh, Tracker, right? Star- stacker. Stacker, sorry. Starry Landscape, scan- Starry Landscape <laughs> Stacker. Say that three times fast. Uh it's a simple it's simple but it's not that intuitive in terms of how to get the image out of there there's no like click here import your images click here to export as whatever you have to kind of look at it and read what's going on in screen in order to get it but once you got it literally takes five minutes to to sort of grok what's going on once you got it you're like okay now i understand how this app thinks and you can you can crank through so the app you can do stacking in photoshop Mm mm-hmm but yeah. the app does something that Photoshop doesn't. So uh, Photoshop, if you stack it, you're going to have to stack your stars and align them. Then you stack your foreground and align them. Then you blend them together, which is in some photos can take hours, right? Yeah. yeah. Starry Landscape Stacker, you mask it. You tell what's the sky, what's the foreground. It stacks the foreground. It stacks the sky and then combines the photo for you. You don't have to do any of that stuff. Yeah, yeah, and that's, it's, it's, and that, ten times. that's the name of the game with software, right? You want you want the path of least resistance to getting to the art that you had in in your head. Yeah, right. so I, I was surprised, like you're saying, on that first try, I was able to come out with something that didn't look completely horrible. I was like, okay, if I really apply myself and and plan and go out and actually do some shots like this i would probably be able to start doing i feel like personally knowing me i'd probably be able to start doing decent milky way shots you know after maybe five or six tries you know going in shooting making mistakes running through seeing what the noise is learning the characteristics of my lens and my sensor and all that and that once i have all that internalized versus you know just being on a beach with crazy creatures lighting up in the in the surf <laughs> You remember that bioluminescence we saw out there? <laughs> yeah, neon, neon, weird creatures in the sand. I don't know. That was weird, but right. Yeah, but we. Yeah, it was better. It was pitch black out there. We couldn't see anything, so we don't know what we were standing in. <laughs> so, but yeah, no, um, I agree. I think that you could definitely get out there, but I haven't stopped learning. It's two and a half years later, and I still have not stopped learning. So yeah. I know that you can continually improve and adapt and add more to your tool bag constantly. So, um, and I personally haven't stopped doing that. I did 22 nights in the month of June shooting the Milky Way, which is the most I've ever done before that. I think the most in one month I had done was like eight or nine, I believe. Uh, so we did 22 nights on the great Milky Way chase, which is a contest I created. Uh, and in that process, I really learned to anticipate for the moon and plan for using the moon in my shots as my foreground lighting. When I didn't have the moon, I use uh, what's called a loom cube, which is a small cube light about yay big. Mm -hmm. And uh, you can remotely trigger those cubes from your phone. So it's like having a, you know, a whole remote control lighting setup. Yeah. Yeah. And I use those all the time in my shots, especially in the newest shot that I posted well, on my Instagram. Now, Tracy, I, I see that there and I don't know. There, this is art, right? So there's no like this is the way you should do it. There's always multiple ways to get to a conclusion, especially when Photoshop's involved. Right. right. But, but in, in my my sort of quest for learning different techniques for doing this kind of photography, I see that some photographers capture it all in one shot and then post process it, you know, and light it, light up your foreground like you're doing, right? Use the Lumi cubes to to light the foreground, long exposure, get the background, and it's all done in one frame for the most part. But there's some photographers that uh, that will shoot multiple exposures. Like some will shoot the foreground elements and light those and get that perfect, and then leave the ki- tripod locked down, obviously, then do their do their star trails or their uh, the long exposure for the Milky Way, stack that and then composite them together in Photoshop. Do you do that? And is that is that sort of standard operating procedure? 
I definitely do that. And it just depends on the situation that you're in. Sometimes I'm in a situation where I can do the, uh, the I'll give you some terms. Stacked is what, what you did. Mm-hmm. You stacked a bunch of exposures for noise reduction. We came up with the term. Um, I don't know if I coined the term or not, but we came up with the term blend. And that is essentially composite. But you're not moving your tripod. It's taken the exact same location, and you're shooting an exposure for the foreground and an exposure for the sky. Mm-hmm. And um, we we came up with that different one because there was a, a gray area there from a, a com- complete composite image. There's over here, you know, composite image being I shot the sky in one location, I took off and. A week later, I shot the foreground in another location. Mm -hmm. So, you know, there, there, I personally do not prefer to do what we call composites, even Mm -hmm. though a blend is literally a composite. On the blends, they're shot in the same tripod location. They're just different exposures for the foreground versus the sky. Yeah. My favorite thing to do is just shoot stacked if I can help it. So that's why I like the foreground, because then I can. Uh, set my exposure for the sky, light the foreground, and have it all in one shot. Yeah, it's like with 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 commercial photographers a lot. They'll do what you're talking about with the blend technique, where you know they'll they'll build their set or whatever the 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 scene is. Um, like I was talking to, uh, uh, yeah, it was a, actually not an astrophotographer, but a rocket photographer. Um, and he and I, this the, the interview's not public public yet, but it will be in a couple of weeks. But he and I were talking about similar techniques to what you and I talk are talking about now, where when you're shooting a SpaceX launch, you're doing a long exposure to get the trail. But he was doing shots where he wanted Teslas in the foreground all lit perfectly with the rocket going over the background, you know. So obviously, and he wanted it, he wanted some early morning light in the background behind the car. So that was multiple images that he had to take from the exact same position, though, and then right. bring them all together in Photoshop. That would be your blend technique versus if he had shot each Tesla in a different location, brought them in, and then shot the rocket, brought that in, and put some clouds in there that, that were from, you know, Shutterstock or something like that, right? I'm just not that good of a Photoshopper. <laughs> at the end of the day, at the end of the day, I, I'm, I'm better at planning a scene that's right in front of me than trying to merge them all together and, and make them look like they're real. So, yeah. I mean, could I become that? Yes, I could, but I, I'm not interested in it. And I have no problems with composites. And I'll tell you, most people don't care if they're composites yeah. as long as they know. Right. As long as the photographer is straightforward and honest. And I mean, polls have gone up on my Facebook group and people ask all the time. They don't care as long as they know. That's interesting. See, that's that's a, that's an interesting perspective because it's like – you know, the, the TWIP audience seems to be polarized on that in some ways, because depending on, well, obviously taking photojournalism out of it, which you don't you don't want to touch any pixels in those images um, because you're trying to represent something that happened in real life and tell a story. Uh, but in this kind of photography, this is more aesthetic and artistic where you're an artist and who cares if he chose to blend or if he chose to composite or if you chose to get it all in one shot or whatever, the end result especially if the end result viewer, and this is the TWIP audience speaking, the end result viewer is not in the photography world. If they're just average people that are looking at your shot in a gallery, a Tracy Lee gallery showing in New York City, and this is, you know, mom and pop looking at this image, they're not going to be like, I wonder what version of Photoshop she used for that. You know? Right. <laughs> so. They just want a cool looking image for sure. Yeah. That's, that's yeah. a different um, audience for sure. But on the Facebook group, they're all photographers. Right. So, um, you know, with me, I like presenting realism. So I know that people that follow me know that if they went to the location that I was at, they could get that shot. Mm -hmm. Yeah. You know, that the Milky Way lines up there, that the North Star lines up there, whatever it happens to be, they know if they go there at the right time and the right conditions that they potentially could get that same shot. And I leave my settings on every single post on Instagram. Yeah, that's cool. And there's a lot of... A lot of photographers out there that feel threatened by that. And at the end of the day, there's an example of Jess and I shot in Joshua Tree a couple weeks ago, and we shot this arch. We were side by side, cameras almost touching, 
our photos look completely different. Yeah. Why? And why was that? Just different exposures? Well, um, we shot, no, we shot the same settings. She had a different focal length than me. Hmm. She chose a different, slightly different composition than me. So she angled it a little bit different than me. And then when it came to putting it in Photoshop, she edits different, different than me. Mm -hmm. So I don't ever feel threatened in giving out my settings. Yeah. Yeah. That's, that's cool. And you know, and that's, I think that's a sign of the times because back in the day, people used to be very secretive about their formula, you know, their secret formula, like a KFC formula or something like, you know, I can't tell you how I do this because otherwise you'll just do my stuff. But like you said, I mean, you could be, it's, you could be this, use the same gear, the same location. And even if you use the same focal length and all that, when you you're still going to process differently because you you have different gray matter right so and different experiences so yeah that's that's really interesting on on how all that stuff goes so okay oh go ahead also what you're looking for in the photo is different me personally i wanted more milky way core and jess wanted more arch so she chose to, i mean like i said our cameras were this close together you know she chose to angle more towards the arch and i chose to angle more towards the Milky Way. And that was just personal preference. And that's going to happen every time. Yeah. So yeah, I'm never ever concerned about that. Yeah, it's a composition. Yeah. Composition. Yeah. And it could be one millimeter and it's could It could be a completely different shot than, than, uh, the one that was taken in, the, in a very similar location. Well, let's, let's wrap this up, Tracy. So I want to, I want to talk about where people can go to connect with you, but if people want to learn how to do this, they're inspired, they see your work, they're probably on your Instagram profile right now as this is being recorded. They see that stuff. They're like, I want to do that. I've always wanted to do that. Where should they get started? Where should they go to get started? So Milky Way Chasers is a huge, huge um, like resource for either new photographers or you know existing photographers. Milky Way Chasers on Instagram. We also have a Facebook fan page and a group. So you can get all the information from the Instagram and the fan page. But if you want to interact with the photographers themselves, your best bet is to go to the group on Facebook. So just search Milky Way Chasers on Facebook. And there's often discussions about uh, different types of new equipment or there's cool articles that are posted or there's information each, you know, one place where all the photographers have all their settings and their photos and their stories behind the photos. Love it. Love it. Cool. And I'll, I'll link to all that stuff in the description for this video on YouTube and in the, the blog post so people can can go straight to it. All right. And what about you? If people want to connect with you and, you know, I know you're doing I don't know. Are you still doing workshops? You were doing workshops, right? Uh, I haven't really started doing workshops. Okay. I do these free workshops that um my friends take advantage of. They're not actually workshops. It's just hanging out with friends. But <laughs> <laughs> You're talking about me right now, right? <laughs> I'm not, not only you. I'm just saying my friends are all like, hey, let's go shoot the Milky Way. I'm all like, cool. And for the longest time, I didn't realize that a lot of my friends were going with me just to learn from me. Yeah. I just pick up on that. Parasites. Uh, Parasites. <laughs> yeah. No, that's great. Because I, I don't like going to shoot by myself. So it's fine. Yeah. Uh, yeah, no, and I, and I like teaching it. I just haven't officially put together a curriculum around it and made the effort to start teaching. So that's something I'm looking at in the future because I get nonstop questions. When are you going to start teaching? When you... So, yeah, yeah. yeah I got to do something about that. But you can find me on Instagram and on Facebook under Tracy Lee Photos. Um, and then I also have a website that hasn't been updated in forever. TracyLee.org, but I will have photos for sale there sometime soon. And um, yeah. All right. That's perfect. All right. All right. We got to close this off. And I have one question uh, that I have to throw out there because oh, a lot of like oh, put on the spot. You're being put on the spot. No, not really. Uh, no, but a lot of people that are watching this are like, wait a minute. She looks familiar. I know her from somewhere. I can't put my finger on it. You have a life outside of photography. You had a life outside of photography. Tell us about that. So people that are like that have that thing in the back of their head, they, they can put it to rest. Where, where do they know you from? Oh, I was I was a cage side photographer in the UFC for about eight or nine years. So I used to be seen on TV all the time or in the background when they're filming the fighters or I was shooting the fighters all the time. So that's one place. I was also involved in Vegas nightlife for a long time. So people saw me all over Vegas shooting photos. Yep. Uh, and I also have a, um, a gun addiction. So I actually <laughs> shoot, 
um, shoot guns. And that's actually my biggest personal account is my gun account. So I have the most followers on that account for people watching me train and shoot. What's your gun account? Let me, I want to list that too. Tracy Guns, T-R-A-C-Y-G-U-N-S. Of course it is. I love that. <laughs> That's so cool. Well, cool. Not, to be, not to be confused with T-R-A-C-I Guns. Okay. Who is an uh, old, old school 80s rocker. Oh, nice. All right. Well, there you go. That's perfect. I want to make sure we got that in there because I know, you know, people would be saying, you know, I know her from somewhere and we can put that to rest. So we eliminated a bunch of emails and communications on that <laughs> just by saying that. Um, and, you know, we were talking about this in the car on the way out to the beach. You know, one of my personal heroes, Mr. Joe Rogan, who's a prolific podcaster and comedian. So, you know, I get to somehow be connected to him through you. So thank you for that. <laughs> So. He's awesome. He's very interesting to be around for sure. Awesome. All right, Tracy. Well, thank you so much for, for doing this today. I appreciate it. Uh, I know you're you're about to jump on a plane again to go someplace sometime nope. this week, Car. right? Car. Uh, oh, you're driving. Where where are you going? Where, and where are you shooting? Uh, we're maybe going up to you. We haven't decided yet. We're just heading up towards Utah. Uh, it's storming, so we've been storm chasing. Last week, we went to go Milky Way chase in Arizona and Utah, and uh, we got stormed out so we actually ended up shooting lightning and chasing storms but i spent the night on the edge of the grand canyon which was really cool we backed up the jeep all the way to the edge and put our cameras down and shot over the grand canyon and it was absolutely incredible but most people would freak out and be like i can't believe you slept right there oh, yeah. slept with my feet out the edge of the jeep and look at you making memories making memories love it yep. Love it. All right. Well, thank, thank you, ma'am. Thank you so much for having me. I appreciate it. It's been great to be on. Of course. You're you're fantastic. How could I not have you on after that uh, that adventure we went on? That was that was, that was a great adventure for sure. That was a great adventure. All right. Enjoy enjoy your your week and uh, I want to see the photos that you that come out of this week. So you okay. know, share. I'll make sure to share them with you for sure. All right, Tracy Lee. Take care. This is Twitter.